Okay, welcome all to our third virtual speaker series in 2022. My name is Christoph Lütke. I'm a professor of business ethics at the Technical University of Munich and the director of the Institute for Ethics in Artificial Intelligence. With our speaker series, the TUM Institute for Ethics in AI invites experts from all over the world to talk about ethics and governance of AI. These events serve as an important platform for sharing new research and exchanging knowledge. Since our launch in 2019, we were already able to run 22 speaker series events. Because of these virtual events in particular, we were able to reach a new and some, to some extent broader audience from around the globe. So we are looking forward to hearing from you today during our discussion. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Manuel Garcia Herranz, uh, Chief Scientist at UNICEF's uh, Frontier Data Initiative, here with us. He is uh, here to talk about algorithms for humanitarian and development work. Let me say a few more words about our distinguished guest speaker. Manuel Garcia Herranz holds a PhD in computer science from the Univers Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He joined UNICEF in 2014 and has been since then working to bring the value of big data to UNICEF, leading research at UNICEF's uh, Office of Innovation and creating collaboration networks and data science tools that focus on the problems of the most vulnerable children. He is very interested in human behavior and dynamics, particularly in the study of computational social networks complex systems and behavior dynamics, and in how new types of data and analysis can be used for human development to reach the hardest to reach and provide humanitarian awareness of places in which traditionally there's little or none. Before we begin, I would like to ask you all to turn off your microphone and camera during the session and submit your questions via chat or raise your hand. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Also, let us know in the chat if you are experiencing technical difficulties. So, Manuel, the floor is yours. Is it working or do we? Screen sharing is working. Yeah. yeah, we'll get there. Is there a problem with the screen sharing or? No, we don't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, now we hear you. Let's try yeah. again. Sure. Okay, fantastic, sorry right. about that. Because yes, the headphones and caffeine, uh, they don't go very well. Um, so sorry about that. Let me share my screen. And sorry, I did not hear the intro. That's why I, I didn't jump into uh, right away. Um, but thanks a lot, uh, Christoph, for the introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be, to be here. And uh, I'm going to try to give in the next 40 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, uh, an internal perspective, more of a... Uh, 
a practitioner perspective on algorithms for humanitarian development. Uh, I'll give a little bit of, of background of, of myself, but I'm a computer scientist by training and I work in, a, in UNICEF. Uh, and therefore this question of ethics, I will probably give it a, a, a different angle than the one we're used to in this speaker series. Um, we all know the trolley problem um, as an ethical perspective, right? And, and it's been used recently also for the self-driving car and many other things and to what ex to some extent what I will be talking of today is on on making the question of not whether you turn on the lever or you don't turn on the lever so you kill five people or one people but what happened to the uh, to the trolley in the first place why what happened to the brakes uh, why was it broken was there any way in which this could be uh, averted so somehow uh, when looking at these ethical issues of artificial intelligence and algorithms I kind of think of, of these two uh, parallel streams. One is by action, so developing algorithms or developing AI despite, uh, we all know that the, the enormous list of, of things that go in there, privacy issues, accountability, transparency, discrimination. Um, a lot of this is being uh, solved for trying to be solved by policy. Not all of it can be solved by policy, but, but a lot of that is trying to regulate all these things and understanding you know, what are the limits of privacy and, and in individual rights towards collective action, etc. But then I'm, I'm very interested after my experience at, at UNICEF on, on the ethical issues by inaction. And that is uh, mostly because I see that AI is evolving and well, algorithm, algorith algorithms and big data technologies, they are developing hugely, and we will talk more about that, um, but not for everybody. So not developing AI despite the potential it might have for public good, despite that AI is also already growing in, in different spaces and probably my, my talk would be more focused on, on that space. Um, to some extent for me, the promise of AI and algorithms, the algorithms in general is on power of automating, um, optimization and, and forecasting somehow. Um, so to some extent it's efficiency and effectiveness at scale. And, when looking at the type of problems that UNICEF uh, works in, uh, epidemics are uh, moving faster than ever and polarization and, and disinformation, displacements due to conflicts, due to climate change, uh, rapid urbanization, all, all these problems, they definitely require a lot of uh, efficiency and effectiveness at scale. We need uh, to make use of uh, forecasting so that we can get ahead of what might come because if, if things come already, then it's gonna be too late. So it somehow seems that the promise of AI is perfectly suited uh, for these type of problems. Um, I'll give a little bit of background of myself. As I said before, I joined UNICEF in 2014. I come from uh, academia. I did my PhD in computer science and I, I was an associate professor at the Autonomous University in Madrid. And I basically joined this massive organization, uh, 12,000 staff and 88% on the field um, 190 offices all over the all over the world, and it works more or less in 300 emergencies per year. Um, it's the largest purchaser of pencils all over the world, and and one of the biggest per, uh, vac vac vaccine purchases also. Um, I came to this massive organization in 2014, and despite all this, I could not find a single big group of AI practitioners, of big data practitioners, or computer scientists. So I landed in actually in the Office of Innovation for a project of uh, six months. And in here, I saw the potential and the need at the same time. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Um, interestingly, when we look at how the world of science has evolved, we see that over the last, um, well, since 2014, 2015, and, um, I basically joined UNICEF when, the, when it was very, very flat in there. The amount of papers that mention somehow artificial intelligence and things like humanitarian work or sustainable development goals for social good has been growing tremendously. So this is a great sign. Uh, and, and it's a sign that somehow made me stay in, the, uh, in, in UNICEF, the, the, the potential to uh, of this type of technologies for social good, which I'm not the only one that perceives that given the, the amount of publications. Um, there is also more data and more data also of the type that more, more types of big data that, from the ones that uh, have more penetration. So mobile phone subscriptions have never been this high. 
Uh, even in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, it reaches about 100 phones per 100 people, so one phone per people, more or less. Uh, so the technologies like satellite image, uh, they've been increasing the resolution uh, constantly, and we have now more satellite data more often and with more resolution. Um, and it's somehow these data production, it creates a, a very exciting picture of the world. Uh, it opened up back 20 years ago, all, all these new um, window for computational social science, being able to ask ourselves questions about why society behaves one way or another, not by doing a small focus group, but by looking at experimental data. Um, but here is probably what this talk will be about. And it's about where is all this talent, all, all the talent that is developing these new methods and technologies. And um, it's actually quite clustered and it's clustered both geographically and both in terms of uh, sectors. And probably a lot of the limitations that I will talk about, they come from this fact. Um, so why are not these technologies being so used in humanitarian development? When I, when I came to UNICEF, um, younger than I am right now and quite excited about the possibilities, I realized that for my colleagues on the ground, there were some very straightforward questions that it didn't appear to me as a scientist coming from a, a European university and, and being super excited about you know, doing computational social science with a bunch of Twitter data, things of this sort. First one is how representative is this big data for the forest? This is an exciting landscape of data production. This is basically a picture of uh, Maputo. Each dot is being illuminated by the amount of data that is being produced in that space. And we can see all the streets and the, uh, you know, the, the center of the city uh, producing much more data than the outskirts. And this exciting landscape that big data gives us, the problem is that it rounds society to only whoever generates data. So suddenly we see those black dots in there, which are basically settlements, they're houses, but they're not producing data. Um, this problem that is present all over the world, it becomes really, really critical in places like Mozambique, where this is not just a small portion of, of, of Maputo, it's a huge one. Um, many times results are also aggregated, so that we've seen with COVID, for example, in which uh, lockdowns all over the place have been restricting mobility, and many uh, companies, governments have been following up. Are these physical distancing measures being followed or not followed or sustained or not sustained? And a lot of that data is coming actually from smartphones, um, whether that's a Google device or a, a Apple device or any other API that allowed us to look at when the physical distancing policy was enacted and what is the decrease on, on mobility that happened in a particular city or a particular country. The problem is that these aggregates, they hide very important differences. And if we disaggregate by poverty, and this is by poverty of, uh, of the data, which we will talk a little bit more about who is not in the data, uh, we see that that average 70% reduction of mobility was actually basically the average of the richest and the, and the middle incomes because the poor, the poor people were not able to reduce that much. For example, this, this is an example of Indonesia. Um, not only that, but in many places, in many in many cases, the social dynamics were reversed. So, for example, if we look at Colombia, before these uh, physical distancing policies were enacted, we can see that the blue line is up above the red line on the image on the right, meaning the rich people were traveling more kilometers per day than the poor people, and after the uh, physical distancing and the lockdowns were put in place, those uh, uh, social dynamics are reversed. So this is another important factor about aggre aggregations. It's not about the data itself, it's just about the aggregation. Um, but now if we look at just what mobile phone users, right, and we say, okay, we, we are working in a country and we're working with a particular uh, mobile network operator, it has these many millions of subscribers. We can split them in quintiles and see these quintiles by, by income or, or, or some estimation of income. How much data is being generated by each of these quintiles? In an ideal equitable world or a data equitable world, each quintile will be producing the same amount of data. Now, when we look at real, real data from Sierra Leone, from DRC, from Iraq, we see that the richest quintile produces more than half uh, of all the data. And the poorest quintile, it goes through 3%, 4%. And that's without thinking about those that are not in any of the quintiles because they don't have a mobile phone, which 
normally accounts from for all of the children, for example. So uh, complete sectors of the population that are being left out of this data. Um, how is this mobility that we were talking about being computed? In, in many cases, well, it's being computed not only by you having a phone, but by the user actually making some action. In the case of mobile mobile phone uh, in, in records, uh, is the, the, the user just making a phone call or sending an SMS. Uh, and each of these things, each of these actions, it gives one data point to the telco. And then the telco aggregates all that and says, well, there is one trip going one way or another. This is the, the technical the technical way without getting into all the, the privacy preserving algorithms and, and so on. The fact is, if there is one user that makes less phone calls, as it, it is the case of, of poorer populations, uh, then their movements are also less captured. And maybe some, some movements are unrecorded. Um, and this matters actually because the network, the aggregated mobility of these different uh, socioeconomic levels is structurally different. The poor people, as we all can imagine, move move differently from uh, the richer, uh, uh, the richer parts of the of the population. And that goes into the question: Can an algorithm predict pandemics next month? This has been ongoing for the last uh, at least uh, ten years, in which we've been using mobility, uh, or better, researchers have been using mobility to produce models of. Of, of pandemic, but the problem is when the, uh, these inequalities in the data are so high, then suddenly these, uh, these models, this forecasting that is running on top of, of the mobility as you are perceiving it from the use of mobile phones, it creates a, a potentially very, very wrong conclusions. And those conclusions are very wrong, not in aggregate, not for the full country, because normally the full country is dominated by what happens to the capital. For example, but it, uh, we can see that poorer places that are more remote, suddenly we can see 50 days delay in peak prediction or an average of six days of uh, delay uh, globally in a country like Sierra Leone for early introduction or 20 days delay for the first case to be detected. So while bias is small for these type of technologies in high income countries, just taking the same approaches and putting them into uh, poor, poor places uh, without knowing how much bias there is there or how to cover for that can be really, really problematic. Um, this, this problem is not just on the big data, but it's extending, it's extended currently to AI training data sets. We all know uh, that an AI practitioner most of the time is spends, the, the, the first time is spent on cleaning and curating data. Um, and therefore there are amazing places like Kaggle, uh, very, very useful for machine learning, especially in AI. Practitioners he has to get you know training data for testing different things. Um, a lot of these data comes actually from the use of apps, and 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 that means that most of the data sets you will find here they are very you know high income country type of data sets like wine reviews or the FIFA 19 complete player data set or ramen ratings uh, and very little about you know polio vaccination uptake or uh, earthquake detection type of things right. Um, but then there are other data sets that one would expect to be a little bit more equitable, like satellite images. At the end, the satellite goes over our heads. It doesn't matter whether you are in the uh, Horn of Africa or in the middle of the North America. And here we had one, one project back in the day on detecting uh, schools, and that gave rise to this uh, GIGA project for providing connectivity to, to all schools. The first problem on providing connectivity to schools is to know where the schools are. Um, and there are some data sets already labeled for uh, infrastructure. And one of the first things that we found is that the satellite imagery in those data sets, even though satellite images are from all over the world, the labeled ones are mostly from Europe, uh, the US, uh, you know, some, a little bit of Asia, not where people live actually. There is a, a big discrepancy between where are the images of those data sets and where the people are living. And actually that means that the images, they look quite different. So what a crop looks like in that data set from what a crop looks like in Malawi, quite different. What a school, a random school looks like in that data set from what a random school looks like in Colombia, for example, quite different. And that means that even these data sets were open and there was an open challenge um, 
so we could basically use the same algorithm. The algorithm claimed to have, uh, the, the winning algorithm of that competition claimed to have a 60% accuracy on detecting educational facilities. Uh, when we tried to uh, run that in Colombia, we got a 6% accuracy. Um, it's not only about where the images are from, it's about the labels. That data set has about 60 different labels for all the functional uh, functionality of, of buildings you can, you can think of, from zoos to airports to educational facilities, recreational ones. The amount of labels for schools is just one. It doesn't matter if it's a high school or a low school or, uh, or a university or, or kindergarten, it's just one. For airports, we have three, right? So, um, this happens also for open images, in which more than 60% of, of the images in the open image data set is from US and five EU countries. Uh, in ImageNet, 53% of the images are just from the US and Great Britain. And that means that the likelihood of detecting accurately whether this is a wedding photo or not, it changes a lot whether you're talking about United States pictures or Pakistan pictures. Um, Okay, so let's think, let's imagine that we overcome all the problems of the bias in the data set and we've been able to, you know, label our own data set and we just made the uh, algorithm and we got it right. Uh, can I really use it? And this is amazingly useful or it could be amazingly useful. Let's imagine that um, poverty maps, for example, are one of the most useful things. They're, they're critically important to know where you put uh, resources or a uh, uh, social, I mean, from social security, health, vaccination campaigns, everything. Uh, but normally, gathering that data about poverty takes years, um, and sometimes things happen like sudden onset, like a uh, like conflict, for example, and suddenly you find a place in which, at the time of the survey of the current data, uh, the cities will look one way, and after that is totally destroyed. How can you actually program anything on the ground using data from before a war? And that's a place where you say, okay, here is where, you know, satellite image and AI models can really help us get a better picture. Uh, and as I was saying before, there has been an amazing progress in, in scientific methods from 2010, in which uh, uh, scientists were looking at the network diversity to, uh, to measure economic development, and then suddenly throwing machine learning at the problem, and then suddenly deep learning at the problem, and then deep learning with combining um, uh, multiple different features. Um, but what we found, because we, we've done this in a number of countries, is that uh, when we try to apply that, one of the first things we find is that there is always an overlap between when the data was for training and right now. So you might have trained a model using, you know, census data from 2015 and satellite images from 2015, and the model reports an accuracy that is amazing for 2016, but it's now 2022. And one of the things that happens is that the mo models lose accuracy over time, and they lose it quite fast. And because you don't have uh, uh, good data to validate, that is very difficult. That model is very difficult to actually put it on, on production. Second, you train a model for Iraq and you have no clue on whether you can apply that model for Iran or for Colombia or for Pakistan uh, because transferring models across countries is really hard and there is very little research actually about transferability, which should be if, if AI uh, was to become, you know, a very day-to-day uh, -day technology for human child development, this should be one of the most fundamental problems. When and how can you transfer a model from one place in the, in the earth to another place in the earth? When do things hold, what things hold, and how to make them hold? And finally, the average metrics of performance. Uh, for every uh, AI practitioner or machine learner, uh, it's very uh, common to report on my accuracies, F1 score or my R square of 0.8. That sounds amazing, but this is one example of one of our own studies in which we got a, an R square of poverty estimation of 0.8, which sounds quite okay. Like, well, I can do really okay. But the thing is that that error is not uniformly distributed, but actually the error is higher in the poorest regions. In average, point eight error. But if you are doing a poverty map, you are not really interested in distinguishing, you know, the middle class from the a little bit richer class. You're really interested in distinguishing the really poor from the not that poor. Sometimes they over a dollar from the slightly under the dollar, right? So 
uh, these are some of the things we've learned that makes uh, you know algorithms not really applicable even when you have all the other things right um, because I have time, I will go into one, one bonus fundamental question, right? Up until now, I was talking mostly about uh, what are the biggest um, impediments for applying AI, machine learning, computational modeling into the ground. I have to say that on top of, of all that, one of the main reasons why it's so hard to apply these things is that um, these algorithms, they need to run on big systems that already run and already work. And it's easy to forget that when you're in a uh, computer science world, whether that's on a startup or on a research institution or on a big company. Uh, nobody knows more about health than a health official in the Ministry of Health. That is something that I've learned uh, over the course of, uh, of my years at UNICEF. And then I can come with a, with a model that takes you know, phone data and, 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 and fancy computing things. Um, unless I'm able to explain that really in a way that is understood and can be validated by the health official, that is never gonna be used and applied. So that, that's one uh, big caveat. If we are not uh, strengthening the machine learning AI uh, savviness of our programmatic humanitarian development workers, it's gonna be very difficult that AI makes a positive change in the world. Now, here is a bonus fundamental research question that goes the other way around. Uh, at some point, we, we were thinking, okay, um, this is not working, but do we know if having an algorithm is actually something good or is it good for how many people? And we got to one very old problem, uh, which is identifying the super spreaders. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem that, that goes back uh, uh, decades, uh, how to maximize information cascades or put in other words, how to get people to buy what you are selling on social media, for example. So you wanna run a, um, a campaign and you have money to just put an advertising in front of six people and you're hoping that they will retweet. And if they retweet, then somebody else might retweet and, and so on. Um, so you wanna put those five advertisings in the people that will maximize the side of your cascade. This is an all scientific problem, and the truth is that there is no single global function of influence. What makes an influence, which might explain, you know, what we see in, in TikTok and Instagram and so on. Uh, it's very hard to, max, to to actually define that. What what will make something viral, uh, and and who are the right people to to do that? The interesting question is that this is the same thing for selling an ad or for stopping an epidemic. Uh, uh, when we're uh, putting campaigns for fighting Ebola, for example, we're looking for working with schools, businesses, or influencers. Uh, in the case of COVID, it has been the same. Information and misinformation, they're part of this maximization cascade problem. So who is an influencer in a network? We can have a network of, of what a village looks like. This is actually a, a real example of a village. Um, and we can use any of these state of the art algorithms to identify what are the five people that it would put the ad in there, you know, by probability of, of spreading over the network, how cascade would be as big as possible. So common known algorithms in the, in the state of the art are the highest degree, for example, choose the five people that have more friends, more connections, um, degree discount, which is kind of like the same thing, but whenever you're choosing one, you're moving it from the network. So you try not to class them or uh, you know, the, the K course or uh, structurally important individuals that have more. Um, these, these are different algorithms on the literature. We can compare that to random. We can compare each of these algorithms to random. What is the difference between using a smart algorithm that will maximize the side of your cascade versus I will just put the information to five random people in there or five random households in this case. One thing we've learned is that, yes, the cascades are larger. So re you reach more people if you use an algorithm, but there is an imbalance, which means that there are a bunch of nodes that consistently receive less information than in a random scenario. Um, in this case, we, we can see a, in blue nodes that with the algorithm receive more cascades. If we always use algorithms for optimization, of, the, of maximization of, of the cascades, um, they tend to cluster in some places and they're in the outskirts people that really do worst. Now, 
that's something that you one might expect, but we quantify that and we said, okay, but how many people? How many people will do worse? Because yes, cascades are bigger, but if they always reach the same, how, how large is that same? And what we found is that, well, that same is about 40%, which means that they're the most connected, which means that about 50% of the nodes do worse with every single algorithm. It's not that you do worse with one, but best with another. Is that if you use an optimization algorithm uh, for maximization, for maximizing the size of the cascade, um, then there is half of the people that do worse in a, in a, in a world uh, run by algorithms. And we know by research that the most connected neural network are normally the, the individuals that are also more wealthy. And from field experiments, we also know that the most vulnerable are not the ones that uh, they are the ones that do not receive information, for example, in deworming treatments or uh, polio vaccination. So up until here, the bad stuff. <laughs> uh, now, is it, is, it, is it possible to build more equitable algorithms? So the, the, the optimistic side of things is that, yes, we can do better. So for example, um, we can put another axis of, in, of, of interest. We can have an information reach in this case, cascade size, and we can put the number of non-vulnerable nodes, for example, the number of people, the number of nodes that will not receive less information through this uh, particular solution than in a random scenario. And this is basically what computer scientists have known for a long while now, which is a multi-optimization problem. You have two axes and then you have a set of solutions and there is what is called the Pareto front. And you can imagine these by defining any other uh, vertical axis, for example, the number of echo chambers that is created by a particular information algorithm. And therefore you can have maximizing cascades and information, but algorithmically speaking, trying to reduce also polarization, for example. Um, it turns out, for example, that all these solutions in here, they have the same average cascade size. The ones of the state of the algorithms, core HD, HD degree discount, they have uh, less non-vulnerable nodes than other solutions. So you can actually make, maybe make the world a better place without losing anything. This, this is something that might happen. It's just, we're not looking at these with, with, enough, uh, with enough attention. Um, so trying to uh, close up a little bit, uh, I think there are a number of uh, really positive signs ahead. The, one of the big problems is that this capacity gap, this uh, uh, digital gap grows as the, at the speed of tech. So we need to hurry somehow, but positive science is the attention that we're seeing by uh, science and research on looking at that uh, uh, interconnection between AI, machine learning, big data, and SDGs and well, the sustainable development goals, humanitarian work, and so on. Um, the biggest problem we have at the moment is that we don't have a common language. So if we are to close this talent gap, some of the things we really need to think of, and that's going back to you know, the trolley problem that I was putting at the beginning and thinking, well, should I turn the lever or not? Maybe the problem is on the trolley. What, what is the problem with the trolley? Maybe, maybe uh, we need to re re revise the, the brakes of the trolley. And maybe what's happening here is that we don't have multidisciplinary ecosystems, not as many as we should, meaning that uh, we don't have uh, the amount of AI practitioners within ministries of health, within international organizations, within the humanitarian development sector as we should. I mean, we don't have the amount of humanitarian development focus, um, uh, you know, research institutions on, on the AI space. Um, also, we need system strengthening really, really bad in the sense that uh, when I look at the AI, machine learning, computer science community, which is where I come from, I believe that we tend to have this view of I will develop the app that will save the world type of thinking. We all want to save the world somehow without realizing that there are amazing systems on the back designed to do that. And we should be more focused on how can we strengthen those systems rather than how can I, how can I build the app that, that saves the world. Um, and that, in, in my opinion, are the, the big gaps that we have in order to ensure that AI is fit for humanitarian development purposes. Because most of the questions that I put above is not because you know, researchers and, and uh, AI engineers, uh, they are evil or or they're not, they don't wanna do things in the right ways. Yes, because they are clustered in particular ecosystems in which these inequalities, they are not as visible. 
Um, I will put some links in here for whoever wants to uh, join more. I would say that on the on the bright side, there is also a lot happening in the in the UN ecosystem, for example, and looking for uh, attracting more talent for connecting uh, internal networks of, uh, of practitioners and, and and trying to make the link between the uh, AI experts of the world and the country offices and the people on the ground. So there is a lot of positive signs ahead, uh, but also at the same time, the, the, the trolley is running fast. So I will leave it here, uh, Christoph, and happy to answer any questions. I, I hope it wasn't too technical or, or too many graphs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Um, and uh, yes, we are, can we please have your questions or comments, criticisms? There is one, um, there is one uh, question that we have here um, in regards to the discrepancy between the labeling and the data sets available and what is currently real. Which tools or process, if any, do you have available to assess ground truth? That, that is one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have. So can put a couple of examples. I, I, one, one of the big, big problems of uh, for an AI practitioner, if they want to do any kind of work on the, that is used for human development is the lack of ground truth. That, that is uh, like, like that, right? So the only way uh, you can assess actually if your population estimation, high resolution population estimation is right or, or wrong is by having some kind of ground truth population estimation. And that is not the case most of the times. Um, we've done it in different ways. For school mapping, we've done it uh, just manually looking at SALTA images, for example, and saying, is there a school in here? Yes or no? Definitely yes, definitely no, I don't know. And that gets you done like 80% of the way. Uh, we've worked with uh, the ministries of education on where the schools, uh, where the schools are. Or we've gone uh, on the ground and actually make, make some uh, check-ins, for example. Now, at the same time, I have to say that there are other ways to do things than just simply trusting blindly ground truth, because that leads, I, I haven't spoke about that uh, today, but it leads to a different variety of problems. If you want to do high uh, resolution population estimations, um, what do you use as ground truth? Well, common sense will tell you census data. And that's what most of the different available high resolution population data sets available have been using. Now, census data in the US, it's really great. Europe is really great. You go to DRC, last census was done 1982. So Steve Jobs was launching the first Apple machine. Up until then, it's just estimations. If you blindly take that and train your AI algorithm to match that, what ends up happening is that you have artificial straight lines in the middle of the cities, in the middle of Goma, for example, a city affected by Ebola three years ago. Big city that from satellite, it looks almost the same uniform. And suddenly in these high resolution population maps, you have a straight line in the middle, a super high density population north of the line, super low density population south of the line. And that calls for, is there any other way to do AI training than just with a ground truth? What happens with when, when ground truth data is noisy? Um, well, we're not the smartest people on earth and we did develop some algorithms that account for noisy ground truth data. So the, the main problem is that normally from a data rich perspective, our question is always, where is the ground truth? And we're not that used to thinking on how can I train things with noisy ground truth. I have many different ground truths, all of them noisy, and I need the, 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 the algorithm to extract whatever makes more sense. Um, so th those would be the, the two different questions. For getting ground truth, you need to work with somebody that's on the ground. That goes for my system strengthening message before. If we don't have AI trained people on the ground, they will never understand why you need to gather geo coordinates, for example, on uh, on, on some things, what is the difference between, uh, you know, putting a point on a map or mapping the contour of a school? So system strengthening first. Uh, but the second one is maybe you need to also think about the, the value of ground truth and how uh, equal, equitably valuable that is uh, all over the world. I don't know if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here's another question. Uh, 
what role might there be for explainability in AI for supporting humanitarian and development work? And actually, this is this is just something that we are working on here to a great extent. So how could this make biases more obvious or might this improve trust or uptake by practitioners and policymakers? All of it, all of it. Explainability, I think, is a, is probably the biggest, the, the first road to overcome. So I would say if you have to drop accuracy, drop it. You need things to be explainable and beyond beyond ethics, just yes, for from a, a practitioner's point of view and a very pragmatic perspective, you are not going to have an epidemic expert try trust a model that uh, cannot understand. So that's the first thing. Simplicity is key. Uh, and uh, I've, I've done myself models many times, uh, some of them more complicated, some of them less. I, I never go for a really black box approach. Oops. Am I still here? You are here, yes. Your okay. presentation is gone, but that's fine. Okay, yeah. Um, I never go for a full uh, black box approach of I throw in 200 variables and see if I can get poverty because that really doesn't give me any um, any clue of what's going right or wrong, but I'm, I'm not the person to judge this by, right? The right person is whoever is in the Ministry of Health or in the uh, social protection or child rights. And they're, as I was saying before, they're really experts. They really know what goes on without a model. You know, they have a very good uh, uh, intuition about that. So explainability, I think is key, not only for the potential bias that might come with it, which also, but uh, also because without that, there is never gonna be a true uh, adoption of these technologies for, for anything uh, as sensitive as my channel development work. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, we, we get the reaction. Thank you so much for these interesting insights. Regards from Michigan. Um, but another question, what role, um, no, sorry, this was um, wrong one. One question about sustainability. How do you think can we solve the challenge of sustainability, if I read it correctly? Do you think improving data sets representativeness and better adjusting the models is already the solution? Or do you think there's another more fundamental way? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, I think the incentives right now from a researcher uh, in or an AI practitioner and a humanitarian development practitioner, they're kind of disaligned. And that is a problem. Um, I think we're seeing a little bit more of that potential alignment. Um, and maybe that's related to to what I was saying before on, on a lot of, uh, you know, the scientific community and especially young people realizing that they, they can do better, right? Uh, the, who was saying that the, the brightest mind of my generation are, are making people think how, are, are thinking on how to make people click on ads. Uh, that was, uh, you know, said like 20 years ago, I don't think that's the case any longer. Now the reason, I think there is an active, uh, well, predominant th thinking on, on the AI community on, on how can I make the world a better place and, and realizing, you know, climate change is coming and, and, uh, and these courses around, for example, carbon emissions of AI, of, of training AI uh, models is, is coming up fast, right? So uh, that might be an open door for that, but it is true that we need to create those multidisciplinary ecosystems. And uh, I don't have the answer for how to do that and might be, um, you know, that universities have a, a really important role to play in creating those mixed ecosystems in which, uh, you know, you have computer science people and ethics people meet with human development people. And I would love to see that that an exchange uh, that I, I've seen in UNICEF, people that work in the Ministry of Health, uh, then they work on the, on the health section. I don't see that transitioning happening from, oh, I used to work at this AI company and now I work in UNESCO. And, or the other way around. I used to work in UNESCO and now I'm in the computer science department of something. Um, 
So probably that's the, the question, how, what are the incentives to create those multidisciplinary spaces? And I'm seeing more and more happening over the last five years. So that I'm, I'm ho hopeful about, uh, but I don't have that answer yet for how to make that sustainable. It's, it always feels like a very uh, uh, brittle ecosystem uh, in terms of, of the disalignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. So um, here's another relatively broad question. Um, what are your thoughts uh, about the most important component for an AI algorithm? Is it good data or good model? And how can one find the optimal balance between the two? Um, you need both. You need both. I would say at the, at the end, um, from a UNICEF perspective, if somebody offers me, I have uh, good data or good models, I would say, I would say send, send me good people, uh, right? So I, I want the experts, don't, don't give me the, the fish, give me the, you know, give me the fishing rod. Um, uh, you can't do one without the other. I would say that probably a lot of the most fundamental uh, problems that we currently have, they come probably from the data. So the, the, the role of data is hugely important. Um, at the same time, we were talking before about uh, you know, things like explainability, um, uh, embedding common sense in algorithms, I mean, some, somehow is what I was saying before with the population estimations with, with background truth. So those, those methods are extremely important, but I would say at the moment, 90% of the, of the problems are coming or for humanitarian development are coming because of the of the lack of 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 good data for for AI training. Not so sure that's about you know we don't we don't have a convolutional networks advanced enough to. Hmm. Um, here's another question that I have, um, which is a general question, but um, I have some thoughts about this as well. Uh, since you are working with so many countries around the globe, do you see there a, a global north-south divide or inequality in terms of access to and benefits from AI? And, and I mean, not just if there is this gap, but is it, is it bigger or is it smaller compared to other technologies? Uh, because in my view, it is, might, might be not as big as with other technologies. How, how would you see that? Um, I would say there is. Uh... And probably because of, of that reinforcing cycle of uh, technology leads to data, data leads to innovation, innovation leads to technology, technology leads to data, and so on. Um, and, and there is definitely that divide. Um, there is many times that, that we see uh, those efforts to the, deploy solutions directly from the high income countries into low income uh, countries problems rather than on creating that capacity on the ground, that sustainability that, that somebody was asking about before. Um, so that is definitely a, a problem and it's a, it's a visible one. At UNICEF, for example, one, one of the vehicles that uh, we created is the Venture Fund. It's aimed at actually, uh, it's, it's like an, any venture fund that you can, you can have outside, except that it doesn't take equity. It just forces open source to come out of that. And also it forces the companies to be based in uh, what we call programmatic countries, so low, low, low and middle income countries. Um, and the main purpose of that is to try to create that, uh, that, capacity, that capacity gap. Um, within UNICEF, I would say the, the same, right? Uh, trying to structure that uh, community of practice, who is doing AI where so that we can have that kind of local uh, connections is extremely important. I, I would say that yes, the, probably these uh, technological breakthroughs because of the speed at which they are being generated and because of the data requirements that they have, uh, uh, they are less available than other technologies in, in low and middle income settings. And that's what I was saying before about the technology, the digital gap grows at the speed of technology. Right? If you don't catch up, that gap is growing. So we might be reducing certain types of inequalities and not realizing that there is an, an, another type of inequality is being generated at a, at a really high speed. 
Um, here we are two more questions which are related, I would say. Uh, and one is in terms of data representativeness, how important or feasible is locally derived data or grassroots AI? Um, a major challenge brought up in our um, responsible AI network Africa is the need for local data hubs. Uh, but this has challenges as well. And related question is, would it be possible to digitalize the knowledge of field workers to gather more relevant data in some way? So this is about grassroots AI, I think you call it that way. Uh, that would be amazing, right? That's uh, one of the things I was saying before about uh, system strengthening, like field workers, they have data, they have knowledge. Um, they are mostly still gathering data for other humans to make decisions, right? So data gathering, in the ground, it still mostly happens for decision makers. Uh, while a lot of the data gathering that happens in the in rich income countries is not is not data is not being gathered for humans to make decisions. It's being gathered for machines to learn or for machines to make decisions, and that's a big big difference. Um, the role of AI in there can be amazingly powerful. So one, one thing is system strengthening, right? How, what, what are the tools that you put on the ground? What are the resources you put on the ground to make sure that these field workers, they begin gathering the data that is needed for the problems that are more pressing? That is one thing. Um, at the same time, we need to acknowledge that some things um, will never be in the data or they should not be in the data. Children is one of them, right? So we're talking about uh, phone data and, and the bias. Well, uh, mobility based on phone data is always going to be biased against children. Children movement, they are not going to be represented there. So if you have a, a conflict, for example, and you're trying to use aggregated mobility data to estimate where there are more unaccompanied children, that you're not going to be able to do that. Um, AI might play an important role, for example, on, on generating artificial data. You don't want to have profiles of real children for, I don't know, uh, training machines for some some sort of uh, medical conditions, for example, but you can gen you can build AI that generates artificial data that looks like children from this particular background or that particular background, and therefore AI itself can play an important role on filling the data gaps that, that we currently have. Um, I think that that component of the data hubs, if taken into account. Uh, the, the, the question was uh, talking also about the sensitivities, right? And I imagine uh, there are many, when, when we say data, we mean many things, right? We can mean uh, artificial generated data, we can mean aggregated data, or we can mean uh, personal identifying data. And the challenges with all of these things, they are really different. But, um, but indeed is one of the things that we most desperately need. And in my opinion, is that system strengthening is, data for machines that comes from the field, right? And that means more uh, training and more tools and more resources for, for how to gather that ground truth data uh, for the next yeah. generation of, of, of machines, right? So I just suggest the, the last few questions and I take two, again, I take two, two together because they're related. One is, uh, I work with uh, NLP and language models. Very often, even if one wants to train models on, on more diverse data, data from less used languages, either doesn't exist or is hard to access. Does, does UN see uh, for itself a role in creating or curating data sets from underrepresented communities and languages? And this, another one asked, why not start out with synthetic synthetic data uh, in the first place? You could better control the system, and then the steps, the second step, go and use real data. Yeah, NLP. Uh, indeed, there are some conversations going on in there, and that's a really pressing. That's a, a really pressing problem. Um, UNICEF itself, for example, it has uh, it has created a lot of uh, a lot of different platforms for youth engagement. Uh, your report is one of, of those. Your, your report started being a, it's a, like a chat bi-directional uh, system so that children can talk about the things that matter most to them. Uh, and, and that voice reaches directly, for example, uh, politicians. So that we, we've used that 
um, in order to raise issues uh, around, the, for example, sexual abuse in schools that in, in less than a week got uh, in a parliament and was discussed and, and uh, the, the health lines were put in place in, in less than two weeks in there. So uh, there begin to be systems in place that you know, create that, that sort of volume uh, of, of text going on, on and off. And that means to some extent problems, for example, because we are more used um, to have humans read those messages compile those statistics. And suddenly that NLP is not just a, an opportunity, it's, it's a need. You need to have a system that automatically classifies messages into which ones are just simply information. And oh yes, that's so cool from something that is really happening. Like in my school said somebody is being abused and you, you need to be able to detect that. Um, and it's a, what I was saying before about that reinforcing cycle, because there are not good corpus in, in specific languages, those systems are not possible. And because they are not possible, it's more complicated to get those corpus in place. Um, at the same time, that information on those systems that are coming from humanitarian development many times, and that means that the information in there is very sensitive. Um, I know that there are some conversations going on. There is a great uh, get together that the UN is beginning to do over the last six years, which is the AI for Good Summit. I'm sure you, most of you might, might know about it. Um, uh, it starts uh, hum humbly, AI speaking, but very powerfully in terms of, of commitment. And, and that's uh, being there is some, one of the things that we, we always, uh, it's always talked about, right? On, on is there a way in which we can, uh, push forward a little bit on, on NLP for, for languages that are more, more vulnerable and there are uh, so many. So any, any thoughts on that, they're most, most welcome, um, but I don't have an answer yet. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, I think I found a nice question. What is from your experience, the most successful AI application for humanitarian purposes, or if not the most successful, your personal favorite? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a really difficult question. Um, I don't know of one that really makes that difference yet. Um, I, I know of the, in the innovation space and I, I know, I mean, the, some, some, but they're never isolated. That's uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go back into a, into a different way. I don't know of any because I don't think there is one that I can really see. As, as being there. Uh, what is the value of one particular app? Um, is the full system that goes, uh, that, that moves on that space. So um, I saw um, colleagues of mine that work on epidemics, yes, using uh, some uh, new news gathering uh, 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 platforms from WHO, for example, the uh, AIOS. And that is very useful at one point in time. Does that make a, a difference over the whole epidemic? No, it does not. But it's something that is already integrated. Is it the best that I know of? No, it's, it's not the best early warning platform that I know of, but it's the one that is being used. And because it's being used at one specific part of a, a moment in time in a cycle of, of response, uh, well, that early warning one is, it, it was, uh, it's something that I think is, is very promising. Uh, the school mapping component that I was mentioning before, that's something that we've been able to scale from uh, one pilot in one country uh, five years ago to the Giga project, Giga.global project right now with I don't know how many millions of school map. Is that all AI? It is not. Actually, AI mostly is Colombia and a couple more countries that we've done that. And the rest is working with education, Ministry of Education uh, and so on. But without that AI component, it would have been impossible to do the rest. So, so that would be my, my second example. Um, hopefully, it will not be one app, the one that I can point at. Uh, I still can. Thank you very much. We are almost out of time, but I wanted to take a final moment to let you know about our next a speaker series event, which will be an in-person event with Professor Aditya Jory from George Mason University on May 30th. Um, and uh, last but not least, I want to remind you that the best way to stay up to date with our news and events is to visit our uh, IAI 
website, subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. I would like to once again thank Manuel Garcia Hans for accepting IAI's invitation and all of you for joining us and contributing to the discussion with your questions, comments and remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs>